Welcome back. We have explored so far two arguments which explains why freedom of expression and information matters. It is essential to our autonomy and free will, to an individual's right to self-development and to truth-seeking. Censorship, on the other hand, negates our autonomy by denying us the right to make moral judgments about what we should read or hear. It denies us the possibility of accessing knowledge and truth. In this segment, I will highlight two more arguments in support of freedom of expression. The first one is that it builds tolerance. And the second is that it is essential to a self-governing society. Let's first turn to the idea that freedom of expression builds tolerant society. Lee Bollinger, First Amendment scholar and president of Columbia University, in his work The Tolerant Society, has argued that free speech establishes tolerance. Through a free speech regime, a vast number of ideas circulate, even those that some may consider as extreme or dangerous or hateful or wrong. Bollinger reasons that if we run up against ideas and opinions that differ from our own, we will learn to accept their existence. We will learn to manage our impulse, almost instinct, to forbid such views. We will learn to manage our impulse to excessive intolerance. Through freedom of expression, we are forced to encounter others others' opinions, others' dignities, others' autonomy, and to tolerate their existence. In his view, a free speech regime is a great social experience in tolerance. The extraordinary zone of freedom of expression tests our ability to live in a society that is necessarily defined by conflict and controversy. It trains us in the art of tolerance and steals us from vicissitude. The best way to think of freedom of speech and press, then, is not just as an aid in the search for truth, but also as creating an unregulated public arena, a special zone of social interaction. Bollinger argues that through the free speech experiment, we commit ourselves to being people of fortitude, I quote him, and we can deal calmly with differences of opinion, scathing dissent and the risk of disorder. We are people of fortitude through freedom of expression. Another theorist, Vincent Blasi, has argued that by according free speech a high priority, one is more likely to build certain traits of characters that are particularly valuable. It builds the experience of confronting evil and falsehood. And I'm quoting from him here. The claim here is not that truth and justice will always prevail in a marketplace of ideas. We will never have such a marketplace, and truth and justice will not always prevail, even if we did. Rather, the notion is that the experience of confronting falsehood and evil will profoundly shape the character of a person or of a society. In this view, the most dangerous ideas can only be defeated by strong persons, not by repressive laws. Lee Bollinger, for his part, does not rule out the possibility of some kind of control over speech beside strong person. But he does not think that government should be responsible for determining what to control. So who, in his view, is responsible for the choice of tolerance? That is a function he attributes to the judicial system. Why? Because in his view, the judicial process gives those opposed to speech an institutionalized, and I will add myself, safe method of objecting to the speech. And thus, at least partially, it gives them the opportunity of explaining and giving meaning to their position. 
judges serve the function of taking over the decision to permit or not the speech to go forward. The limited number of voices who pronounces the reason for tolerance makes a coherent explanation more feasible. That is from Lee Bollinger. He also thinks that judges are expected to have mastered the tolerant mind, and it may not be true for all, but we will hope for quite a few. Finally, he thinks that, is a, that the judicial process is a much better process that left with the legislative because of the intolerance impulse of most politicians and of the political process in general. This is a complex theory which I cannot summarize in a few minutes, but luckily we uh, have had the opportunity to interview Lee Bollinger himself on his theory, so I will invite you to refer back to the additional video to find out more about the tolerant society and freedom of expression. But let us turn now to the fourth argument in favor of freedom of expression. It is essential to a self-governing, meaning democratic society. It builds democracy. This has become the most often quoted argument in support of freedom of expression. Indeed, it is the most widely referred to by courts and policymakers around the world. Freedom of expression is essential to democracy and the exercise of democratic principles and values. American constitutional scholar Alexander Meckeljohn has particularly put forward this argument. He argues that if citizens are to be able to rule as democracy requires, it's after all the rule of the people by the people, if citizens are to be able to rule, they must be able to communicate freely, including with those that they elect and who govern them. They must be free to criticize, question, challenge, all of which requires full access to information and ideas. Michael John asserts that all speech related to the process of self-governance must be absolutely protected against governmental interference. Free speech regime thus allows citizens to govern more effectively and wisely in a democratic system grounded on the will of the people because they have access to the information that they need in order to make the system work. Eric Barrent, the political theorist, has referred to the defense of free speech on the grounds of democracy as, and I quote, probably the most attractive and certainly the most fashionable free speech theory in modern Western democracies. There are indeed a large number of court decisions that insist on the centrality of freedom of expression to democracy and democratic principle. I will cite a few here from um, around the world. Let's begin with Europe and the European Court for Human Rights, which uh, in one of its judgments said, freedom of expression constitutes one of the essential foundation of such democratic society, one of the basic conditions for its progress and for the development of every man. It is applicable not only to information or ideas that are favorably received or regarded, as inoffensive or as a matter of indifference, but also to those that offend, shock or disturb the state or any sector of the population. Such are the demands of that pluralism, tolerance and broad-mindedness without which there is no democratic society. It's a very important um, statement here and one that I will return to over and over again over uh, the next few weeks. Now let's move to Latin America. The Inter-American Court of Human Rights has also recalled the democratic significance of freedom of expression and it said, I quote, freedom of expression is a cornerstone upon which the very existence of a democratic society rests. It is indispensable for the formation of public opinion. It is a condition sine qua non for the development of political parties, trade unions, scientific and cultural societies, and in general, those who wish to influence the public. It represents, in short, the means that enable the community, when exercising its opinion, 
to be sufficiently informed. Consequently, it can be said that a society that is not well informed is not a society that is truly free. And then let's move to Africa, the Supreme Court of Appeal in South Africa. And I'm quoting again from that court. Suppression of available information and of ideas can only be detrimental to the decision-making process of individuals, corporations and government. It may lead to the wrong government being elected, the wrong policies being adopted, the wrong people being appointed, corruption, dishonesty and incompetence not being exposed, wrong investments being made, and a multitude of other undesirable consequences. It is for this reason that it has been said that freedom of expression constitutes one of the essential foundations of a democratic society and is one of the basic conditions for its progress and for the development of man. Now, these three quotes are actually very representative of what you will find throughout the last, let's say, four decades when it comes to court ruling over freedom of expression. In a related development, Amartya Sen, the Nobel Prize winning economist, has observed that there has not been a substantial famine in the history of the world in a functioning democracy with a free press. So he extended the impact of freedom of expression as essential to a self-governing society to freedom of expression as essential to protecting the people from the worst ills in the world, including famine. This, he explained, is because democratic governments have to win election and face public criticism and have strong incentive to undertake measures to avert famine and other catastrophes. He goes on to state, we cannot find exception to this rule no matter where we look. And he did look. He looked at the famines of Ethiopia, Somalia and other regimes, famine in the Soviet Union in the 1930s, famine in China in 1958 and 1961. Nearly 30 million people died actually in that particular famine and they were largely due to governmental policies remaining uncorrected even though they had been seen to be leading to the famine. And those policies went uncriticized and not changed because there was no opposition parties in the Chinese parliament. There was no free press. There were no multi-party elections. Nobody dared voicing their voice against the bad policies. It is precisely this lack of challenge that allowed the deeply defective policies to continue, even though they were killing millions each year. The same, in fact, can be said about the world's two contemporary famines occurring in North Korea and Sudan. That, indeed, is the conclusion of Amartya Sen. So, information allows people to scrutinize the action of a government and is a basis for proper informed debate of those actions and, hopefully, for the government to shift actions, to shift policies when people are telling them those policies are hurting us. And I'm citing here from Amartya Sen. Political and civil rights give people the opportunity to draw attention forcefully to general needs and to demand appropriate public action. The response of a government to the acute suffering of its people often depends on the pressure that is put on it. The exercise of political rights, such as voting, criticizing, protesting and the like, can make a real difference to the political incentives that operate on a government. There is another impact for freedom of expression and information and another argument as to why we need to protect it. Through public debates and public education, that is, through freedom of expression and information, social problems are better addressed. 
So it is not just about famine, which of course is already enormous, but Amartya Sen extend his analysis to other issues which are not as acute as a famine, but have long-term implications. And he's looking, for instance, at fertility rates. And he is finding that public discussion have an important role to play in reducing the high rate of fertility that characterize many developing countries. Looking at India, he found that there was substantial evidence that the sharp decline in fertility rates in India's more literate state had been influenced by public discussion of the bad effect of high fertility rate on the community at large and on particular on the life of young women. So access to information, access to freedom of expression, public debates have a general and important impact on any kind of social issues, including those that have direct impact on people's life or on a society. So to sum up, this segment was a brief introduction into complex issues in philosophy and political theories. Freedom of expression teaches tolerance and build tolerant societies. At least this is the experiment. It is also essential to self-governing societies, meaning to democracy. This last argument has become the most widespread theory on free speech, advanced by politicians, civil society, activists and court alike. It is not only important and central to the working of a democratic regime, it is also crucial for governments to be able to function properly, that is, to respond to the need of the people. Without information, without a free flow of information and debates, politicians, governments are not listening. They are not criticized and they may take the wrong decisions. They may enforce and implement the wrong policies, including policies that may hurt the people. In the next segment, we will turn to the implementation of those free speech theories in the global public policies of the 21st century. We will see how concepts dating back to the 17th and 18th century have found their way into the United Nations, into global public policy making. See you then.